Every year, over 12,000 people die without leaving a will and seemingly with no next of kin. But often, there is a relative who stands to inherit, and that's where the air hunters come in. On today's programme, a woman who had dedicated her time to charity work passes away, leaving a fortune to the family she hadn't seen since childhood. She was very shy, and I rather imagine this has contributed to, you know, losing touch over the years. And air hunters uncover one of the youngest heirs they've ever found. I think, if anything, it's made me realise that money isn't everything. It's, it's family, that's the main thing. Plus, we'll have details of some of the hundreds of unclaimed estates. Could you be in line for a windfall? In the UK, about two-thirds of people do not have a will and therefore leave no record of their last wishes. If they die and leave an estate and an obvious relative cannot be found, then the money automatically defaults to the government, who last year made £18 million in unclaimed estates. Air hunters must leave no stone unturned and there are over 30 companies competing to track down beneficiaries and put them in touch with a fortune they never knew existed. With so much money at stake, there's a lot of competition in the air hunting world, so time is of the essence. I have every confidence in the team, <laughs> and I'm sure that we'll triumph in the end. Fraser and Fraser have been air hunting for 40 years and have handled over £100 million worth of inheritance in the last 10 years alone. The search for an air can take them anywhere, so the team must exhaust every line of inquiry in their hunt for beneficiaries. It's 7am on Thursday morning, and at Fraser and Fraser's, work is in full flow. The Treasury's weekly list of unclaimed estates has been released, so case manager Tony Pledger and the team are assessing which deserve further investigation. And there's one case in particular that Neil thinks the team should home in on. What we're going to be looking at is Margaret Doreen Mooney. Dies in Chingford in 2009. It's a valuable estate. Property is going to be worth certainly above £200,000. So very, very valuable for us to work. Um, it's also down here in the southeast, so it means it's going to be very, very competitive. There's going to be a lot of other firms working it. So um, really, we need to pull our finger out. The company have very little information to go on, so they use census and birth, death and marriage certificates to build a family tree for the deceased. Going back generations and generations, the team hoped to uncover potential heirs to an estate. Margaret Mooney passed away in Chingford, East London, in July 2009, aged 88. She left behind an estate worth in excess of £200,000, based on the value of her home. Having lived in the area since the 60s, Margaret had been a well-known, if quiet, member of the local community. I live not quite opposite Margaret, but we've lived here since 1967 when I first got married. Of course, at that time, Margaret was living with her sister Hilda. They were very different people, different as chalk and cheese. Hilda was very extrovert, and she, from what I can gather, did lots of travelling, always um, had her nails manicured and, and everything like that. Margaret was much quieter. They didn't do a lot of things together. They did more things, different things on their own, but they shared the house together. Despite Margaret's sister Hilda passing away 10 years ago, Margaret remained independent and living in the house. She was a well-composed lady. She, you know, she went to the hairdressers regularly. She had her hair done. She used to go out smartly dressed. I don't know exactly, but I think she worked at the hospital at Hackney. And all I know is that she wasn't happy to have to retire at 60 because, of course, she hadn't been married, she hadn't got a family, and that was her life, really. On retirement, Margaret was determined to continue leading a full life and began working voluntarily in the tea bar at Whips Cross Hospital, a role she enjoyed for over 20 years. To actually do that into her 80s shows that she liked to be with people and around people. And, you know, that probably for her was her social life. The kindness Margaret had shown to others throughout her life was later repaid by the local community. Towards the latter years, we've noticed that she became more frail. So we used to actually keep an eye on her. And we used to monitor the fact that she was OK by the her television went on of an evening. I think people do genuinely care about each other around here. We see something that we don't think is right. We will be nosy, I suppose, is what people might say. <laughs> But on Margaret's death, 
it was these same neighbours who bid her a fond farewell after no next of kin came forward. We were concerned that there wouldn't be, mm. because she was, you know, an old lady on her own, that there wouldn't be very much, but she actually had quite a nice yeah. send-off, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she was, did, yeah. I think the, the funeral really fitted the type mm. of person that she was. It wasn't fussy, it, it wasn't over the top, it was just very That's simple. Right. I just remember her as a very independent old lady who always was happy to give you a smile or have a little chat and pass the time of day with you. Back in the Air Hunter's office, the research is underway. With the case seeming to be based initially in Chingford, case manager Tony calls you at Lindsay. Hello. Hello, cheerful. I want you to slip over to Chingford. Throughout the UK, Fraser's have a team of researchers on standby who are able to hit the road at a moment's notice. Their job is to track down vital clues and information on the case and eventually sign up the rightful heirs. They have to work fast, as a rival air hunting company is never far behind, so there's no room for error. Pleased to meet you. You at Lindsay is one of Fraser's travelling air hunters and is based in Watford. So Tony has sent him to Margaret's house in Chingford to see if he can gauge a value for the property she left and to see if the neighbours might be able to offer any clues about her background. In the office, Tony and Joe are working on the father's side of the tree and seem to be making some headway. At the moment, the Mooney names are quite good and they're based in and around Hackney and that sort of area, so it's been quite easy to identify at the moment. Joe has sort of romped along a bit and she's got aunts on the father's side and therefore the father of the deceased might have three sisters who might go on to produce children, but at the present time we don't know. On the other side of the tree, the mother's side, the name the team are working on is frighteningly familiar. Well, the surname we're looking at is Fraser, so in the circumstances, yes, it's a nightmare. She's Edith Mary Fraser. I believe this is an aunt of the deceased, but I don't really know that. And all we know at the moment is that she's born in 1876 in Mile End and she's alive in 1891 as a spinster, which, bearing in mind, she'd be 15, is no surprise. Other than that, I can't really find a marriage for her and I can't find her on the census after 91. Uh, ran around in circles, really. Alongside case manager Simon Grosvenor is senior researcher Gareth. He's finding his investigations no easier. On the uh, maternal side, we've got three uh, aunts and uncles, uh, Alexander, Edith and Albert. Um, Alexander and Albert, reasonably good names, but uh, as yet, I can't find them on the census. I've got them all single, um, but I haven't got them later on with their partners. Uh, it could be that they don't marry or don't do anything, but uh, I'd like to say it was going brilliantly, but they all seem to disappear. I'm not quite sure why yet. So far, the office has discovered that John Fraser married Louisa Brown and they had four children. They have found records showing that one of these children, Alice, married James Mooney and had a daughter, Margaret. But what happened to the other Fraser children? Did they too have families of their own? Edith Mary Fraser. Meanwhile, Simon thinks he may have got a result on Edith, Margaret's aunt. I couldn't find a marriage for her, and then we got some info that a couple of them had died, and there's a death for an Edith Mary Fraser in Bethnal Green, which is the right district, right on age, in 1900, which is just before the A1 census, which she's not on. So that looks as if she's her. A few miles away in Chingford, Hewitt has arrived at the deceased Margaret's house. Let's see what the neighbours could actually tell me about the deceased. Good morning, sorry to trouble you. Just making some inquiries into your neighbour who passed away. Yes. Um, did you know much about her today? No. I just said this morning that no one came to visit her. Uh, she just used to go out to the um, hairdressers and that's, and that's all we ever saw of her, really. Right. We, she know, well, as far as we know, she didn't have any relations. How much is this property worth, do you? Um, that one, probably worth... 250,000, something like that. Thank you very much for your help. All right, take care. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. We never saw any family, and uh, I say the last one was her sister who died quite a few years ago. Very sad. Back in the office on the farther side of the tree, Tony and Joe are racing ahead. From a neighbour of the deceased, that um, she had a sister who died about 10 years ago. So we researched into that and we found out her name was Hilda Edith Mooney. 
um, she died about 10 years ago, as I say, and we don't think there should be any more near kin, so that's why we're going back to cousins. We've got an aunt of the deceased who might marry Ernest Benjamin Wyatt. From that marriage, there are two children, potential cousins of the deceased, Harold Ernest Wyatt and Daisy Elizabeth Wyatt. We've got three potential marriages for Daisy Elizabeth Wyatt, all of which either or none could be correct. So we're trying to look at all those three. Harold Ernest Wyatt, potential cousin of the deceased, would seem to have been born in Walthamstow, but probably died in Plymouth in 1979. Elizabeth Mooney, aunt of Margaret, married and had two children, Daisy and Harold. But did they go on to have children themselves? Elizabeth's sister Caroline had one daughter, Kathleen. All this research poses as many questions as it does answers, but it has thrown up a potential heir, and Tony has her on the phone. We couldn't find any other brothers and sisters for you, but, but you're an only child, right? Good, OK, OK. Your mum um, would have had some sisters, I think. She had two sisters, Sarah and Elizabeth, and, and, and a brother, perhaps James, I think. Did, was, that, was that just the four of them in the family? Could you tell me what, what was Winifred's married name, then? Bishop. Right, and, and, and this son that's still alive, I mean, would you know his name? Five years. Oh, good. That's a good name. Thanks ever so. Bye. I've just put the phone down on a paternal cousin of the deceased called Kathleen Cutting. She's got a good family knowledge. She knew the deceased. Um, and seen her for years as you don't. And she was also able to confirm her other two aunts, one of whom had four children and one of whom died without any issue. So it's beginning to look like there's going to be possibly about eight heirs all told on the father's side. So there's, you know, certainly enough heirs to make it worth their while. Tony's call to Kathleen has been really useful. She has been able to confirm that her aunt, Elizabeth Mooney, had two more children. This adds two more cousins to Margaret's tree. Kathleen's phone call has also revealed the names of seven of her cousins once removed. If they are still alive, then they would be heirs. If they have died, then any children they had would inherit. It's looking like there's a lot of work for the air hunters to do. Having made such headway by only 9.25 a.m., Tony feels he deserves a break. Get a cup of tea. Well, I'm, I'm waiting for Tony, Bob Barrett. Yeah. I'm now going to ask Bob Barrett and ask him to go around and, and, and interview Mrs. Cutting. Okay. Hello. Hi, Bob. Listen, uh, how, how long to Maiden, do you think? Um, uh, I don't know, half an hour, I suppose. That's good, right. OK. Well, they've obviously been doing their work in the office uh, very diligently. It's, um, it's only half past nine and they've already found an air, so that's pretty good going. Coming up on Air Hunters. Tony calls for reinforcements in his bid to sign up all the airs ahead of the competition. And a visit from Bob Barrett stirs up memories of family members not seen for decades. I've lost touch with a lot of my relatives because I'm, I'm an old person and uh, I haven't seen Margaret for years and I was rather surprised that there should be any, any sort of connection at all. Hunters can be found all over the UK, and the search for a rightful beneficiary can take them anywhere. Celtic Research is run by Peter and Hector Birchwood from their offices in Wales and London, and their regional case managers work from home. Saul Marks is based in Liverpool. Good afternoon, Celtic Research. Saul had to work fast on the case of Olive Sontag, as it had a high-value estate. I will get the file out. Thankfully, it was relatively easy to solve. From the time that it got to me, uh, when the case opened, to the time that we signed the main air, was about 14 hours, so it was one of the quicker ones. And although the investigation was quickly put to bed, it left a lasting impression on those involved. I think, if anything, it's made me realise that money isn't everything. It's, it's family, that's the main thing. Olive Sontag died in 2008 in a care home on the Isle of Wight, aged 84. She left behind an estate worth an estimated £130,000, but no will. Olive married Charles Sontag, a photographer, in 1956, and their partnership lasted more than 30 years, but they had no children. After Charles died in 1989, Olive lived alone for 10 years, after which she developed dementia. 
When she was no longer able to manage on her own, she was moved into a nursing home where she spent the final years of her life. The sad thing with Ollie being here was the, the fact that nobody came to visit her. She had no relatives and it just made it so sad. But it's a family home, so we treated her like part of the family. She did tell me at home once that she had a sister, but I said to her, where is your sister? She said, oh, I don't know, we lost touch an awful long time ago. And that was the only reference that she made to any family. As fate would have it, Olive was able to be buried with her husband, Charles, who had died 20 years before her. I found her husband's grave when I went to um, another lady's funeral. And I thought, oh, we found Olive's um, husband's grave, Charlie. So we were able to have her buried with him, which was really nice. It sort of finished it right for Ollie then, really, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that she was back with Charlie. That was lovely. Having left behind an estate worth an estimated £130,000, the case was a potentially lucrative one. So Saul would have to work fast to crack it. We knew that Olive was uh, living on the Isle of Wight when she died. Um, we were able to find her marriage certificate and establish that her maiden name was Kevin. And from that, we were able to look for an Olive Kevin birth and found her birth near here in Birkenhead. Um, and from there, we were able to look for siblings. And we found uh, a brother, Norman, who died when he was very young. Um, and we also found a sister called Doreen, and we were then able to look for children of Doreen, and that was the, the avenue that we had to research next. Ernest Kevin married Catherine Bennett, and they had three children, Olive, Norman and Doreen. Norman died as a child, but Doreen married and had three children, Jeanette, Martin and Suzanne. As Olive had no children, Jeanette, Martin and Suzanne would be heirs. Martin was married twice, but sadly he died very young. He was only 43 when he died. Um, but he had had several children, and we were able to establish that one of them was still living very close by, and that was Cassie. So it was my job then to get over to where Cassie lived and uh, sign her up on behalf of the company. Saul pulled up and he said, um, are you Cassandra Connolly? I said, yeah. He said, uh, was your father Martin Connolly deceased? I said, yeah. He said, we need uh, to go inside, sit down and have a talk. You might be able to inherit a lot of money and the colour just drained from my face. I was shaken. It turned out there was one company who had visited her beforehand and had left a calling card. And while I was there, another company, a third company, had um, knocked at the door um, and she was able to tell them that she'd already signed with Celtic Research um, and that she no longer needed their services. So uh, it was very exciting in terms of the competition aspect. 20-year-old Cassie Connolly lives in Liverpool with her mother and is studying to be a tattoo artist. Her father, Martin, Olive's nephew, died of a heart attack in his early 40s. Well, my dad died when I was 10, and my mum got divorced when I was eight. And he, so he obviously moved out, he had his own house. So he'd spend Tuesdays and Wednesdays and weekends with him. Um, I always remember we had the same dinner every Tuesday, uh, macaroni and cheese, it was a sunny delight. <laughs> and I'd sit and watch Buffy in his little flat. Um, when he died, it was completely unexpected. I just went, be went to bed one night, I was staying at his house. We'd spent the night watching DVDs. Um, so I went to bed and when I woke up, my mum was there, so I was confused instantly anyway. Um, and she said, my dad took ill in the night and he died, he had a heart attack. Um, and that was it. It was complete shock. My body went into shock, I was ill for the next couple of months. Um, and it was hard to deal with being so young as well. I didn't know how to handle it. The memories I've got of my dad is the big, friendly giant he was. He was over six foot tall. Um, and I always remember having to run, like, to keep up with his strides when we were walking down the street. I've just got the, the memories any kid will have of the dad, really. And looking after me and the big, friendly giant, that's it. <laughs> After Martin died, Cassie had very little knowledge of her father's side of the family, and so news of Olive was surprising. It was a bit of a shock to find out that I had a great auntie I knew nothing about. Um, I was quite sad as well that I only got to learn of, it, learn of her existence, really, because she died. I would like to have known Olive when she was alive to find out about my nan and maybe more about my dad if she knew anything. Um, so it, it, was, it was bittersweet, really. Coming up, Cassie decides to pay her respects to Olive in person 
and visits the home where she spent her final years. There, now that's her at home, in her, in her house, oh. with her dog. She's still quite beautiful. Yeah. And... For every case that is cracked, there are still many thousands which remain a mystery. These cases sit on the Treasury's unsolved list and can remain there for up to 30 years. The estates can range wildly in value from £5,000 to many millions, with the rightful heirs completely unaware of the windfall they could claim. Today, we've got two cases air hunters have so far failed to solve. Could you have the answer? Could you be in line to inherit? Joyce Lily Anthony passed away in February 1999 in Hackney, London. In the decade since Joyce died, nobody has come forward as her next of kin. Did you know her? Could you be entitled to her estate? Elizabeth Barbara Mountjoy Errol died in South Strand, East Preston, in September 2000. Did you know Elizabeth? Could you be in line to inherit her estate? Back in London, the Fraser's team are tracing heirs to the estate of Margaret Mooney, who passed away in Chingford in 2008, leaving behind an estimated £200,000. So far, the team have established from neighbours that Margaret died with no living near kin. Her father's side of the tree has been relatively easy to solve and revealed Margaret had three aunts. Travelling air hunter Hewitt Lindsay has been making some inquiries with neighbours into Margaret's background. Good morning, sorry to trouble you. Just making some inquiries into your neighbour who passed away. And Bob Barrett is on his way to visit a potential cousin of the deceased in Berkshire. Although Margaret was a shy character, she never hesitated to offer her assistance to those in need and showed a continued commitment to voluntary work and charity until the end of her life. Margaret was uh, awarded uh, um, one of the long service medals that we give out to people. And this is to celebrate the fact that they have shown so many years of dedication. It's not just that they have signed up for that, but that they have turned up for the duties day after day. We're extremely proud of those people. In addition to donating her time to charity, Margaret also donated a large sum of money to one of her favourite causes. Another neighbour has said that she's actually got a plaque on the wall from the Lifeboat Association. She wouldn't brag about it at all. She would just, if she wanted to give a donation to people, she obviously just did it. After Margaret's death, the neighbours decided to follow her lead and donate some money in her memory. We made a list. I'm very much into lists. Um, we had a list of everybody to knock on, didn't we? Yeah. And everybody that we knocked wanted to um, put donate. in, put donate. And quite a number of them wanted to come to the funeral as well. So in the end, we got enough money to um, put a very nice floral tribute for the top of the coffin and a donation of £60 to the Whips Cross Connaught Day Centre and £60 to Lifeboats. So I think we did yeah, we quite well, really. More than two hours after research began, Gareth and his colleagues are still struggling to make headway on the maternal side, and the name they are researching is Fraser. We're getting a bit competitive on the, on the uh, job in the company because Jo, who's working with Tony, has uh, got her side up to date, whereas we, there's five of us working on this side, have got absolutely nowhere. Um, so Jo's beaten us, basically. <laughs> I think she just got lucky. We've clearly got the harder side of the job. Fraser, I mean, Fraser's a terrible name to work. There goes my bonus. What Gareth has managed to uncover is that Margaret's mother, Alice Fraser, had three siblings. Alexander John, Edith and Albert. He knows Edith died before 1911, but what happened to Alexander and Albert? According to a census, Gareth knows one of the brothers also died before 1911, but which one? So basically, we've got one outstanding who's potentially going to have children. But it's one stem we can't find at the moment, so it doesn't really help us at the moment. Another clue from the census research is that John Fraser, Margaret's grandfather, worked in the tea trade during the early part of the 20th century, a highly lucrative industry at this time. It was a very, very busy life, and it was an incredibly dynamic trade. Tea was pouring into Britain from all over the empire. We would have had thousands of small and medium-sized tea businesses all prospering, because in John Fraser's time, all the tea that was sold in the world was auctioned in London. I suppose from a social point of view, as a tea merchant, John Fraser would have been in the 
upper echelons of the commercial world. So they would be in the same social category as bankers and headmasters, headmistresses, etc. So they would, they would definitely be highly regarded because it was a very skilled and experienced trade. It was a very secure business. And tea, of course, was Britain's favourite beverage uh, by a mile. In fact, at that time, about 50% of the fluid that we took on a daily basis was tea. In Chingford, Ewart is keen to report back on what he has learned from the neighbours. Tony, pleasure, please. But Tony has more pressing issues to deal with, like his 9.45am cake break. I hate when I do this, you know. Hello? Hello, Ewart. Tony needs Ewart to head over to Southgate to meet a cousin once removed to Margaret. It doesn't appear to be any competition on this job. I can't, I can't believe it, actually, because it's, it's, it's worth a bit of money. While Ewart makes his way over to Southgate, Bob Barrett has arrived at Kathleen Cutting's house, a paternal cousin of Margaret's, for an interview. Nice to meet you. What I'd like to do, if, if you are in agreement, is do a little family questionnaire. How many children were there from your parents' marriage? Just me, one. And, to your knowledge, were either of your parents married more than once? No. No, they weren't. And your mother's maiden name? Mooney. Mabel Mooney. Mabel. Yes. That's a museum name. It is, isn't it? Kathleen has verified everything she told Tony on the phone earlier. Bob will leave paperwork with her to look over. And recounting her family history has stirred up memories of Margaret for Kathleen. Well, I knew her when... Uh, we were both little girls, because just a little bit older than I am. She was very shy, and I rather imagine this has contributed to, you know, losing touch over the years. When my uncle died, we really lost contact completely. With much of the father's side of the tree solved, the team working on the mother's side have been desperate for a breakthrough, and finally it's arrived. Francis has identified the marriage of... Albert Edward Fraser and Jenny Henderson Clark in Winnipeg in Manitoba, which occurred on the 3rd of December 1919. We do have an agent in Canada. And he might be able to do something, but it's not helpful. And Tony has his second heir of the day on the phone, Michael, son of Daisy Wyatt. And we think that you'd be entitled, as would be your siblings. Now, I understand that Donald, I think he might have passed away in Colchester about ten, ten years ago or so. Was he married to somebody called Margaret, do you know? Primrose, oh. Now, did they have children? That's the most important thing. Two boys, right. And would you be in touch with them at all? No? Michael has filled in some more of the tree. He confirmed that his brother Donald married and had two children, who would be heirs. He also informs Tony of his sisters, Joyce and Peggy. Both of them had children, who would now be heirs. His information is further filling out what is already a very crowded family tree. Tony needs to send a travelling air hunter to interview Michael as soon as possible. Quite possibly. Thanks, bye. Right, what's happening? I've got no idea. Six. Tony? What? What number's that, mate? 452. I've got a tree, yeah. Hello? Hi, Tony. Right, I've just been to see Mrs Cutting. Yeah? Her son told her not to sign anything, um... Yeah. Until he'd seen it, so I've left her agreements and. Um... Well, as you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, but Bob Smith doing nothing. Have you? In one north. In one north. Tell him, tell him. Yeah, Bob, Bob, Bob Smith. Go to Wisby. I'll catch you in a minute. No okay, right. Thanks, um, uh, Dave. Uh, Bob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what day is it? Um, well, I think it's probably sort of put over have a cup of tea and regroup time. Okay. That's okay with you. I'll wait to hear from you then. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Bye. With Tony not knowing whether he's coming or going, one thing that is for sure is that Bob Smith is on the road. On such a high-value case, there's no time to lose, so Bob has been called in for reinforcement. He's being sent to see Michael in Cambridgeshire. Meanwhile, Ewart has been sent to see Anthony, a paternal cousin once removed to Margaret, and arranged a meeting for a few days' time. 
With Michael's revelation about Antonia, a paternal cousin twice removed to Margaret, Ewart is sent to her home immediately. Bob Smith is, is uh, will be going somewhere, yes, to um, Whist Beach, I think. Um, and we've got Ewart is popping down to N8. And we've got somebody else, I can't remember what his name is, he's having a cup of tea. So, you know, we're, we're, we're coming along, we're nearly there. And finally, Gareth has an answer on the fate of Alexander John, uncle of Margaret Mooney on her mother's side. We've just had the death of uh, Alexander Fraser, Fane Street. Um, Alexander John Fraser actually died as John Alexander, he's a police constable. He was 38 when he died, so obviously that's quite a lot of scope uh, for him to have got married him. Um, we think he was single because we can't find a good marriage for him. Um, we've just got the death certificate, and from that we know that he um, died on 19th of October 1910. Um, the informant's not very good, though, because it's just a coroner. And the reason it's just a coroner is because he actually committed suicide and drowned in the River Lee. So it hasn't got us huge amounts further, but we do know a bit more about him now, which is good. Gareth and the team can put Margaret's mother's side of the family on hold and wait to see if Canadian inquiries offer any further leads in a few days' time. In the meantime, Ewart has arrived at an heir's house in North London, but unfortunately, she's too ill for a meeting today, so Fraser's will have to write to her instead. Meanwhile, Bob Barrett is on his way to Newmarket to see another potential heir. And Bob Smith's arrived at the home of Michael, a paternal cousin once removed to Margaret, and more importantly, another heir. Hello, Mr Woods. I'm Robert Smith from Fraser and Fraser. One of the relations going back through your grandmother's family has died without making a will. If I could start with your full birth name. Michael. Leslie. And Richard. I think my, uh, my family all wanted to have a little piece of the action when they... Right. ..named me. And the little and, one, is And it? that's Paddy, that's my daughter's uh, right. son. Now, how many children from your parents' marriage? My eldest sister, Peggy. Yeah. My second sister, Joyce, who's died. I don't know what's happened to Peggy. She's disappeared. Oh, right. I, I think the last time I knew of Peggy, she was living in Shoreham, but that was years ago. Right. So there was Joycey. Yeah. And Donald. The eldest, you say, was Peggy, is that right? Peggy, Peggy, yes. Now, any children at all? Jocelyn and Ian from the second marriage. The second yeah. marriage. Hello. You OK? He's strong, isn't he? Yeah. Hey. Michael's knowledge of his family has helped fill in some more information on the tree, so Fraser's will help him make a claim to the estate. It was a, a, a surprise when the call came this morning. It's too early for me to say I've got plans, because I, I wouldn't know. But uh, I'll wait and see if anything happens, and, and I'm sure my family will, if there was anything uh, of any size, would be more than willing to help me decide how to spend it. That was uh, a very nice interview with a very lovely gentleman and his wife and a grandson. I'm confident we'll get the contract. 38 miles away, Bob Barrett has arrived in Newmarket, but after a long drive, the air doesn't seem to be at home, so Bob calls on a neighbour. If it works, in a regular hours. All right. Bob decides to leave a note to let the air know he called. Back in the office, spirits are high. It's half past two in the morning, in the afternoon, um, and I'm pleased to say that through diligent research on behalf of my colleagues, um, we would appear to have this case fairly well finished. Only about eight years, I think. But we spoke to the majority of people, we visited the majority of them as well, and at the present time, it all seems to be going very well, I'm pleased to say. When the case finally closed, the company managed to sign up nine heirs, all on the father's side of the family having beaten competition from rival firms. These beneficiaries will share in Margaret's £200,000 estate. Saul, at Celtic Research, has been investigating the estate of Olive Sontag, who died in 2008, leaving behind an estimated £130,000. One of the five heirs to the estate, 20-year-old Cassie Connolly, has only just learned of the existence of her great aunt. I would like to have known Olive when she was alive to find out about me nan and maybe more about my dad if she known anything. As Saul's research into the family continued, he has been able to bring Olive's past to life for Cassie. This is Olive with an aeroplane. And Jan writes, I don't think Olive owns this plane. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if she flew it, you never know. 
Yeah, so it, it would make sense that that's your dad. Yeah. Just nice thinking of it as him. It's, it's nice to look at him. Have you ever, ever seen any of him at that sort of age? No. No. Never. It, it certainly makes sense that it's him, definitely. Yeah, but that does look like Doreen. Yeah. With the revelation of family members she never knew she had, Cassie felt compelled to pay her respects to Olive in person and decided to journey to the Isle of Wight, accompanied by her boyfriend, Jake. No, I think it's a good idea going to the Isle of Wight, actually. So, uh, obviously, if you're inheriting money off a family member and uh, not going to find out whether it's obviously disrespectful or not to obviously go find out more. And this also gives her a chance to search more into her family background as well. Cassie and Jake have an appointment with Daphne from Whiteley Bank House, where Olive spent the last few years of her life. Today is quite important to me because I'm getting to find out about a relative that I didn't really know I had, and I'm hoping to find out more about my dad as well, and that whole side of the family. So I'm just about to find out now, and I'm excited. As Olive seemingly had no next of kin, all her possessions and memories have been kept safe by the care home. So next of kin. We found you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like a film star, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You can see how beautiful she was. She was lovely. Oh, wow. And this is when she was older, look. So she was still beautiful then, so... Yeah. This, the pictures um, Sol showed me that Jan, my auntie from America, sent over, this resembles her a lot as when she was a kid. Oh, right. And that actually looks like my dad. Um. So I think that might have been my dad when he was younger. Is he still alive? You no, he, no. he died um, ten years ago, nearly. Yeah? It's coming up to ten years in January. OK. He couldn't have been very old, could he? No, he was 42 when he died. That's my dad. Mm. As, uh, I think so. Coming here, the whole situation being made so much more of a reality to me. I want to go and see where Olive was buried. I, f I felt like I've just dealt with the whole family member dying, so maybe a bit of closure. I, th I think that's it's happened in such a short time, but it is sad, so I, I want to go and see where she was buried. Olive was buried in the Isle of Wight, beside her husband, Charles. I'm just really glad that I've been given the opportunity to do everything I've been able to do and learn of a new family member and come, come and say goodbye to her, really. Me and Jake spoke about I'm going to come back at least once a year and come and visit and put some flowers at a graveside. I'm just really happy and, and sad at the same time. I'm glad I got to come and do this. And I'm glad she's buried with Charles as well. It's really lovely. If you would like advice about building your family tree or making a will, go to bbc.co.uk. Family tragedy jeopardises the dream of a new life, but did they go for the Gold Coast? Wanted Down Under Revisited is next. And then two very special properties in the best of homes under the hammer here on BBC One Scotland in an hour.